Hi guys, uh, this is uh, uh, like our 73rd Zoominar series uh, today and our speaker is Professor Amol Dighe from Department of Theoretical Physics, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, he is going to speak about neutrinos and for, for the first time somebody is speaking about neutrinos in the program. He will give the overview of the subject and uh, uh, thank you Amol for accepting uh, uh, to give a Zoominar for this forum and uh, we are welcoming you from our side uh, and uh, you, you can start right now. Okay, so thanks Ayrton for uh, giving me a chance to uh, speak at this forum. So I understand that uh, this is perhaps the first talk on neutrinos. So I try to give uh, an overview so that when other talks of neutrinos come uh, uh, later, people also will be able to appreciate them. Uh, just for some uh, kind of advertisement for what's coming up later in the talk, uh, we will also learn about uh, a new uh, fresh sort of of the press in nature, which came out last week. And we'll be able to appreciate that when um, uh, we go through the first part of the talk. So all of you perhaps can see this picture in front of you. And uh, those of you who are somewhat familiar might understand this as a particle shower coming from the sky. So we are always bombarded with showers of particles that come from the sky. Uh, it's mainly cosmic rays, uh, primarily protons that come and interact with the atmosphere um, and give out various subatomic particles like uh, pi ions, uh, which are here in the pi, uh, zero pi minus, some protons, some nucleons, some electrons, some positrons, and uh, some muons. Along with them also come some particles called as neutrinos, which you will see here in red coming down. And you will also see that these uh, particles, neutrinos, denoted by dotted lines actually go deep inside the mountain and arrive at land. Okay. So we will all come to this, uh, all of these things will be revealed as the top ones. Uh, but first what we'll do is we will try to understand a few basic things of, about neutrinos, which is equivalent to learning a new language. Okay. So we try to learn the language in which we will describe that stuff. So firstly, uh, these objects, which we call as neutrinos, uh, are basically omniscient. They are present uh, everywhere in the universe. And whenever we look at the sun, for example, we actually are looking at neutrinos. Um, I will come to some interesting facts about neutrinos from the sun, uh, in fact, perhaps right in the next slide. So we do get neutrinos from the sun. Um, I just described neutrinos coming from atmosphere in cosmic rays. Uh, which you see right here. So we have observed some neutrinos coming from uh, supernovae, which is called from the collapse of a star or a spherical collapse. We observed them in 1987. Uh, we have seen neutrinos coming from the crust of the Earth uh, because Earth has radioactive elements. Uh, it has uh, sodium, uh, so sodium, but uh, uranium, uh, potassium, thorium, for example. And that reactivity gives us neutrinos. We call them geoneutrinos. So all of these kinds are natural neutrinos that we already have observed. Apart from that, we expect that with the Big Bang, when neutrinos got produced, uh, all over the universe, uh, in any corner that you go, you'll always observe about 330 neutrinos per centimeter cube. We know that if uh, the way we understand cosmology currently is correct, then this is the right picture. However, we have not yet seen these neutrinos, and we will, of course, come to that at some point. So these are all natural, but in addition, nuclear reactors produce neutrinos, and particle accelerators like CERN also produce neutrinos. So we I just tell you that. I have a question. Yeah. So apart sure. from all these possibilities, which one is the maximum uh, giving the contribution of neutrino? Which one? Sun. 
Sun. So Sun is the largest, and I will in fact give you some numbers in the next. Oh, okay, okay. Because remember, each nuclear reaction is in the core of in the core of the Sun actually produces nuclear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can see, for example, uh, let's give you some idea. Okay? So uh, you know about the CMBR, right? cosmic microwave background photons, which are about 400 per centimeter cube. And as we say, photons are the most abundant particles that we know of. Okay? If you look at neutrinos, the cosmic background neutrinos are about 330 per centimeter. Okay? So which means that they almost compete with number of photons, and therefore they are the second most abundant particles in the universe. Okay? Um, uh, importance of this is that even if you go away from any stars, galaxies, stuff, and so on, you will always keep on finding this, just like you find the So, uh, another one. Yeah. So, because of this reason, people are taking neutrino very seriously in the context of cosmology at present. Correct. Yeah. So, if for example, neutrinos had a larger mass, they would have contributed a lot to the dark matter. Yes. Because they happen to be very, very light, they don't contribute a lot to the dark matter, but in principle, they are part of that. Yes. yes. So, uh, thanks for pointing this out, because my next point was to emphasize that they are the lightest massive particles we know. Uh, when I say massive, it means non-zero mass. Of course, if photons are zero mass, so they are, of course, lightest. But if you leave the massless particles out, the lightest particles that we have already recognized are neutrinos. Uh, their mass is at least a million times less than the electron. The electron is 0.5 mega electron volts, whereas we know that the neutrinos are lighter than 0.5 electron volts. Okay? Uh, although we haven't been able to measure the mass directly yet, but the bounds that we get are simply bounds coming from cosmos. Next important thing, is that they are the most weakly interactive particles that we know. See, everything else that uh, we have, uh, electrons, neutrons, protons, or uh, you know, the particles, uh, undergo strong, weak, and electromagnetic interaction. Uh, neutrinos are the only ones in the standard model that undergo only weak interactions, no strong, no electromagnetic. So basically, that means they only are weakly interacting. They don't interact with light. And therefore, by definition, they form dark matter, as we just said, although it's a very, very small fraction, much less than a person. The impact of their weak interactions can be seen in these two lines that you perhaps saw on the screen. If you have got a radioactive source, let's say in the laboratory, which emits alpha, beta, or gamma radiation, uh, normally you have uh, some kind of uh, lead bricks with which you protect yourself. And the thickness of those bricks is about uh, 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, maybe maximum 50 centimeters. So this tells us that normal alpha, beta, and gamma rays from radioactivity can uh, be stopped within about 50 centimeters. However, if you wanted to stop neutrinos coming from the sun reaching the earth, and if you decide that I want to put a lead shielding between myself and the sun, the thickness of the lead shielding if you calculate, it would be of the order of 90. Of course, we know that's impossible because the distance between the Earth and the Sun is about um, eight light minutes. So this tells you that neutrinos coming from the Sun basically cannot be stopped from um, reaching the Earth in very, very long. So Amol, I have a question. So you have mentioned about small fraction. So what is the abundance of this neutrino uh, in the dark matter, like uh, which we call this uh, omega nu h square, what, whatever. Sub, sub. Okay, so this value will actually depend on the mass of the neutrino. Okay. okay. So right now, abundance is only given as uh, depending as proportion of mass of neutrino. The way to calculate that is to take 330 per centimeter cube as the cost of that uh, background neutrino and multiply that by the mass. Okay. So my rough estimation is less than 0.1% uh, of uh, total load. Okay. 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 Hello. Okay. Yeah. I have a, I have a question. Uh, you said that uh, neutrino do not interact with light at 
light so mm -hmm. do you mean uh, at tree level or i mean at the loop or effect through effective yeah. vertex they can uh, interact at tree level okay there's no vertex with light because they have no electromagnetic field loop mm -hmm. levels of course they uh, okay through through effective vertices they can okay yes of course yes. Okay, good. So now the question is, if they are so weakly interacting, how do we observe them? And of course, though there are many techniques, I will uh, give you, you know, one major technique that is uh, essentially the, the core of how we detect neutrinos, which is by having the neutrino interact with something to finally produce a charge particle. Our detectors are tuned to look at charge particles. So let's take the example of this detector, which is Super Kamiokande, which is uh, in Japan. And this detector essentially consists of about 50 million liters of water. So what you see here, this is of course a huge tank. And if you can, it's very hard for me to give you an estimation of what 50 million liters of water will do. But of course you can uh, imagine by looking at this detector, uh, where this is a big tank of water in which you will see a small boat and the boat has three people sitting. That gives you the type kind of scale of the detector. Each of the dots that you see here, a small circle, is a photomultiplier tube which detects light when light enters. Okay. And what these people are doing is they are right now cleaning up these photomultiplier tubes. Um, very slowly, the water will rise up. Uh, you no, know, well, they go around cleaning the photomultiplier tubes and they will get out from the top. So now, why photomultiplier tubes? The idea is that neutrinos will interact with, uh, with either nucleus or electrons and will give out a charged particle. In this case, I have shown an electron. Now, this electron, if it is traveling very, very fast, okay, so faster than the speed of light in water, then as you perhaps know, it produces what's called a Cherenkov line. Okay, so any particle which is charged and travels in the medium faster than the speed of light, then it produces uh, a Cherenkov line. And this Cherenkov light travels through the power of a cone. This cone uh, can be uh, reconstructed by looking at the signals coming in the photomagnetic. Okay. So that's the way that you try to uh, identify neutrinos, especially in detectors of this kind. Now, of course, the efficiency of this is extremely small. Okay, let me give you some numbers. Uh, I just mentioned in answer to some question earlier that the maximum flux of neutrinos on Earth is from the sun. And uh, to give you an estimation, uh, from our bodies, every second, about 100 trillion neutrinos are passing through. Okay, so 10 power 14 per second. And uh, that number is valid, uh, whether it is day or whether it is night. Okay, so given that, you can imagine that the number of neutrinos passing through the detector is going to be very large. In fact, it's on the order of 10 to the power 25 per day. However, it ends up observing only about 5 to 10 neutrinos per day. So this means that out of the 10 to the power 25 neutrinos, which pass through super Kamiokande every day, most of them simply pass through doing nothing, but about 5 to 10 are detected. Okay, so that tells you that uh, uh, even though the flux can be large, the number of neutrinos that we can actually observe is very, very small. As a result, if you want to observe neutrinos, you need to build very large detectors and you have to wait for a very, very long time. And that's why you will observe that all the neutrino experiments are planned to run for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, etc. So this part is again something crucial to keep on the back. So neutrinos, of course, fit nicely with our standard model. So this is the standard model in front of you for those who have uh, not seen it before. Uh, these six are the quarks, okay, up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom, out of which up and down quarks make up protons and neutrons. Other ones decay very fast, so we can't really see them in atoms. In leptons, uh, you are of course familiar with electrons, but they are mu and tau, uh, which are also charge minus one particles. However, they are heavier than electron. Mu is about uh, 200 times heavier, and tau is about uh, 3,500 times heavier than electron. 
So these three, uh, E, mu, and tau, are collectively called as charged leptons because they have charges. And corresponding to each of them, there is a neutrino. It's called as electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino. So these neutrinos are, uh, have these three names. I would often call them as mu, e, mu, mu, and mu tau. Uh, they are all chargeless. They are spin half. They are almost massless. And they have ODV. Okay, so they interact only with Z and W bosons. And uh, uh, they don't interact with uh, gamma. They don't interact with G. Okay. I am not talking about Higgs. We will come to that at some point. Of time. Okay, With Higgs, it's uh, slightly complicated. OK, so of course, I said that these are my three uh, neutrinos, but I didn't define them properly yet, which I will do now here. So what is electron neutrino? An electron neutrino, by definition, is that which produces an electron when it interacts with something. A muon neutrino is that which produces a muon, and a tau neutrino is something that produces a tau tau. Okay. So the kind of neutrino, or the flavor of neutrino, is defined based on what is the charged particle that they produce finally. In addition to neutrino, we also have the antiparticles called antineutrinos, okay? and they are denoted like this. They are called as nu e bar, nu nu bar, and nu tau bar. Okay? And the way to define them is if by interacting they produce a positron, which is an antiparticle of electrons, so E plus, I will call this incoming particle as an electron antineutron. If it produces nu plus, this is a muon antineutrino. And if it produces tau plus, it's a tau antineutron. So this is, in some sense, the language in which we are going to talk. So let me take a pause to see if there are any questions about this, because this is uh, very, very germane to what we are going to see. OK. So then I will talk about, I will come to the main part of the talk. So I'll first tell you something about the journey of neutrinos, some kind of historical context in which we understand neutrinos now how they were discovered, how we discovered that they oscillate, and what are the open questions about neutrinos that we have. This is a journey that spans uh, almost the last century. Then uh, I will turn the, uh, the mode or the mood around. And now we will try to understand about astrophysical objects when we get neutrinos. In the first of, a part of my talk, we will understand neutrinos by looking at uh, astrophysical sources. In the second part of my talk, we understand astrophysical sources by looking at it. And uh, I will end uh, by telling you something that is happening very, very recently uh, how neutrinos are playing a big role in what is called as multiplicity. Okay. So let's start with the journey of neutrinos, starting with the discovery of neutrinos. Species. Some of these you may have heard of, some of these you may not have, but uh, things are interesting at any point of time, even to pay much. So first story is the story of nuclear beta decay, uh, which were discovered uh, in the, perhaps the first decade of the 20th century. Um, a nucleus decayed into a daughter nucleus and emitted an electron. However, for those who, uh, uh, know about conservation of energy and momentum, you immediately notice that if a single particle decays into two different particles, then both of these particles must have exactly uh, fixed amount of energy. So if I apply conservation of energy and momentum, that will tell me that electron coming out of this will have a fixed energy. If I try to plot, number of electrons on y-axis and energy of electron on the x-axis, I should get something that looks you know, somewhat like a delta function. Only values will be here to observe this curve, which looks like a strong peak. Experimentally, of course, what was observed was this big curve, which was spread uh, all over electron energies. And that tells you that somehow in this reaction, energy moment of conservation is integrated. That's something that we physicists do not like. Uh, however, there was no solution of this till about 1930s. Uh, in fact, uh, people, uh, let's say, as uh, uh, as serious as needs more, had suggested 
that it's possible that energy and momentum conservation does not uh, is not obeyed at uh, atomic and nuclear rates. However, uh, Mr. Pauli, our neutrino hero, actually proposed a uh, sort of reluctant solution. He postulated a new particle called as neutron, uh, which was later renamed as neutrino. Um, uh, Pauli was very uh, tentative in suggesting this solution. Okay? In fact, he did not go to the conference where this solution was being suggested, giving the excuse that he wants to go to his, his village for some party. Uh, See, these days we theorists are uh, quite open about trying to uh, just postulate loss of new particles. Uh, 100 years ago, that was not the case. However, it so turned out that the particle that Pauli actually postulated actually exists. Okay? Uh, he, of course, had to, had to face a lot of people asking this question, um, saying if the particle is too little and tacking to detect, we cannot take it on faith that we have discovered this. Okay. So that's, of course, uh, part of science as we all know. The discovery of neutrinos actually came in 1956, which we realized about uh, more than 25 years after the postulation. Okay. So till this time, people were doing experiments, but still finding nothing. The experiment was done by Rhinos and Cohen. Um, they had this uh, scintillation detector. The detector was taken very close to a nuclear reactor so that there will be a large flux of antineutrinos that come from a nuclear power plant. Now, these reactor neutrinos, UE bar, as you see here, uh, interacted with protons uh, inside this medium. This medium was water with uh, cadmium chloride, uh, and therefore, water, of course, has lots of hydrogen, which provides the proton. Uh, this reaction gave you neutrons and a positron. This positron uh, got absorbed by interacting with electrons present in water or in the medium and gave two gamma rays uh, whose energy was about the mass of E plus and E minus, about 0.5 mm. So this is the conversion of mass into energy. This was one big signal saying that somehow a positron has been produced. At the same time, uh, this neutron, which was produced, uh, got absorbed by cadmium nucleus, which is a good neutron absorber. It went to cadmium star, the excited state, and then decayed by giving another photon, which was slightly delayed because this uh, CD star, excited state, had some light. So now your final signal was three photons, two photons of 0.5 mega electron volts each, and one photon which came slightly opposite. And this finally confirmed that indeed uh, the reactor actually gave some anti neutrinos because we observed these people. Uh, this experiment was uh, had a budget of a million dollars, and that's why the neutrino was called a million dollar particle. Of course, it paid back um, because these people got Nobel Prize in 19. This was a discovery of the first neutrino, and this was the, the date on which we say neutrinos were formally born. Any questions here? Okay. Next, we go to Mio Nuclear. Uh, hello. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, so, sir, I have a question. Uh, so, till this sure. time, neutrinos were observed. Uh, like, do people were thinking that neutrinos have some small fraction of mass? or they were uh, considered to be almost like photons, uh, massless, I mean. Yeah, I think, I think nobody really cared about neutrinos having mass in this point. As far as I know, people just thought that they are massless particles. Okay, and uh, only after uh, uh, the oscillations were observed, uh, they started considering about that. Correct, yeah. See, for me, theory fit very well uh, when you took uh, these as just massless particles. Uh, you know, the, the curve for cross section fit perfectly fine because you know, one, well, even now we do not have uh, enough resolution for our beta decay spectra to look at the mass of the So at that point of time, nobody even took this question very seriously. Okay. Okay. Uh, so next we go to the discovery of muon neutrinos. 
and this came as sort of a surprise. Okay, the surprise, the reason I say surprise was the following. Uh, see, people had in some sense tested the blood, no? in, in, in the sense that they knew that if in a reaction, energy momentum is not conserved, it is possible that there is an escaping part. So you look around for different reactions for which energy momentum is not conserved. And one of those reactions is the DP of pi on. And pi on goes to a muon, uh, and of course, nothing else is seen. So you expect that it also will go to a neutrino or an anti neutrino, uh, which means that you could do uh, uh, experiment which is similar to Randers and Cohen. Just get this anti neutrinos coming in your reactor, in your detector. They will interact with some nucleon and will give a positive. So, in some sense, uh, if these produce neutrinos, then you will see, you should see some number of positive. Uh, this experiment was uh, done in uh, about 1962. The surprising result was that they never observed a positron. Okay? So reaction of this kind had actually zero number of events. On the other hand, they observed 29 positive neons. And uh, yeah, this basically told you that whatever was coming out of pi on DK was different from what comes out of nuclear reactions. And that told you that uh, this must have been a different particle, not the same particle that Ramos and Cohen had detected. So, this particle, therefore, should not be a uh, electron anti neutrino, but a muon anti neutrino. Remember, anti neutrino is the one that produces a positively charged particle. And for doing this, uh, Steinberger, Schwartz, and Lederman, who had set up this experiment, uh, got their Nobel Prize in 1980. So, this was kind of unexpected. I'm not saying that people did not think there were multiple flavors because there were papers before this that they did talk about possible multiple flavors. However, uh, the, detect, uh, the detector was actually designed to look at positive. Okay. So these two were surprising neutrino discoveries. The third neutrino, which is good out, was discovered actually very recently, uh, almost in year 2000. And uh, it really did not create uh, uh, any big surprises because by that time, the model was quite different. Okay. So next, I'll go to the discovery of neutrino oscillation. So all of this started with the sun because, as you know, sun was the largest source of neutrinos, and therefore, a lot of them were available to the observed. Inside the sun, we know that effectively, uh, protons combine to make helium or hydrogen combine to make helium. However, this happens in many, many stages. Okay? So stage is not simple one, but first it makes uh, uh, hydrogen two or deuterium, uh, and then they combine make three helium, and yeah, these are many different stages. Each of these stage gives you neutrino of different energy. So if you see here, energies have been written uh, in red, which tell you that uh, different reactions give different neutrino. Now, um, to look at these neutrinos, we also need detectors which are sensitive to different energies of neutrinos. Okay? So the first aim was, okay, some use neutrinos, detect them at night. Okay? And one of the first experiments were the experiments by Davis et al. at Homestead, uh, which used the chlorine as the basic material. Uh, neutrinos from the sun, when they interact with chlorine nucleus, would give you an argon nucleus and an electron. But you can't see the electron. The argon nuclei are radioactive, but they have a certain uh, lifetime of the order of a few weeks or so. So this tank used to be emptied, uh, I think, every month or so, and number of argon atoms were counted. Okay? So literally, it is like counting a handful of atoms from a very large detector. However, Davis et al. did manage that, and they were the first ones to actually detect neutrinos from the sun, uh, in some sense, confirming that the sun shines because of neutrinos. Another experiment was experiment using gallium as the detecting material. They use uh, gallium uh, trichloride. Okay. And again, uh, electron neutrinos interact with gallium to give germanium. And um, this was again a tank uh, which was uh, emptied um, every, every certain interval 
and the number of germanium atoms will come. Many years after this came Kamiokande, which later on became Super Kamiokande. This is the one which is the online detector in the sense that the neutrinos interact with electron. Uh, this electron that comes out comes out with a very high velocity, and then it can use Cherenkov light and photomultiplier to see. So the advantage of this third experiment was that it told you that a neutrino has arrived immediately in time. So this was the sort of online. Uh, John Bacall uh, was the man who actually uh, did the calculations of expected solar neutrino fluxes. And you can see these fluxes here on the right hand side. The x axis says energy of neutrino, and y axis shows the fluxes. Okay, you will see that a flux of uh, neutrino that comes from PP reaction is the strongest, whereas others are very, very small. A y x y scale is in the log scale. However, you see that because our detectors need a certain minimum sensual energy, it's not possible to observe proton proton neutrinos just yet. In particular, for water Cherenkov detector like Super Kamiokande, energy has to be more than about 5 MeV. If you take chlorine experiments, they can detect neutrinos which are down to 0.8 MeV or greater, and gallium can do this from about 0.2 MeV. Okay. However, these detectors were quite small, the gallium and chlorine ones, and therefore it was very difficult to figure out if the neutrinos that they saw came from this PP or they came from any of the higher So, first target is achieved. We can see the sun with neutrinos. Okay. Uh, the picture that you see on top is a very familiar one. You take it from a camera, put an exposure of one by five thousandth of a second, and you get this picture of the sun. In this picture, you see light from the sun surface. Now, the light that appears here actually is because of nuclear reactions happening millions of years ago. The reason is because uh, the photons which are produced in the nuclear reactions in the core actually take about a million years to scatter and come to the sun surface because photons keep on scattering themselves. On the other hand, the picture that you see at the bottom is a picture taken by Super Kamiokande. It's a picture of neutrinos coming from the sun. Uh, the size of this uh, big picture is quite big. In fact, the, uh, the white bright dot that you see at the center is about 15 degrees. So it's, it's really large. And that happens because uh, the, in the super detector, you cannot determine the direction of the node very precise. Okay, there's an error of about 15 degrees. However, it's just good that even without light, we are able to see X. Uh, See the sun in between. Now, we of course know how much light we get from the sun. So, we should know how many neutrinos should come from the sun. It's a simple calculation, and you could do it at the back of the room. And if those match, then we would know that we have understood how the sun shines perfectly. However, that did not happen. And to understand that, you can look at these top two plots. In order to understand everything in the plots or all the details, uh, the big bar that you see here in chlorine, the yellow, green, and some dashed, is what we expect from the sun. Blue is what you observe. Okay. Again, in the water detectors in the middle, the yellow is what you expect, and blue is what you observe. Also, in the gallium detectors, the same thing. Okay. So, it turns out that in all kinds of detectors, only about 30 to 50 percent of neutrinos from the sun are actually discovered, others are not. Um, if you go to the right hand side figure, it is a plot from Super Kamiokande, and it shows uh, observed upon expected, and again, that at every energy is about 0.9. So, in, in short, about half the neutrinos seem to be lost. Okay. So, that's a puzzle uh, uh, to be resolved. And uh, Ponte Corvo, uh, Bruno Ponte Corvo was the one who suggested uh, the, the solution that we know works now. So the solution is that maybe electron neutrinos mix with some other kind of neutrinos. Okay. And the uh, mass eigenstates are not the same as flavor eigenstates. Once this happens, quantum mechanics tells us that 
uh, after some time, some of the electron neutrinos will convert to other kind of neutrinos. The detector that we have designed was looking only for UE, and therefore, if UEs get converted to some other kind of neutrinos, which are UE or U tau, uh, then it's possible to explain our observations. But again, this is possible only if neutrinos have different masses and the masses. The fact that it turned out to be true tells us that we and new tau do not have different masses. So we'll come to that later. This was the idea. Um, once this idea came, people tried to discover its consequences. And one of the major consequences, consequences were discovered by Wilkenstein, Mikhail, and Smirnov, was that it's perfectly fine that neutrinos do mix. However, this mixing will get affected by matter inside the sun. And they showed uh, by uh, simple calculations that there is a resonance inside the sun, a small region inside the sun, where most of the flavor changes will take place. So the solar neutrino getting away to something else does not depend only on mixing, but also on the matter distributing inside the sun. So this was, of course, a very great uh, discovery or a very great way to test whether in fact indeed this happens. The question is, how can we check that the reason for solar neutrinos getting lost is simply the change of flavor from the neutrino? For this, the experiment that actually worked was called SNO or the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory in Canada. Uh, the leader of that was Art McDonald, who actually we got Nobel Prize in 2015. Now, so this detector was very clever because it used a heavy water Cherenkov. It means that instead of water, you use D2O. With deuterium, now, the same detector can be used to look at three different kinds of reactions. One is neutrinos on deuterium, giving you P proton, proton, electron. This reaction is sensitive to the flux of electron neutrinos. The second reaction, is a reaction where the neutrinos interact with electrons. And this reaction is sensitive to the flux of electron neutrinos plus one sixth the flux of mu and tau neutrinos. The third reaction was the reaction of neutrinos with deuterium, uh, giving you neutron, proton, and neutrino. And this could measure electron neutrino flux plus flux of mu and tau neutrinos. So note that these three reactions were sensitive to a different combinations of, uh, of neutrino species. And therefore, if you try to plot the flux of electrons on the x-axis and flux of mu and tau on the y-axis, depend each of these results will give you band. The red um, experiment, the red observation gives you the red band, blue will give you blue band, and green will give you green band. And the fact that all of these bands intersect at one point tells you that your experiment is consistent. Moreover, the blue band is sensitive to simply the sum of the two fluxes. And note that even when you oscillate, the sum of the fluxes cannot change. The oscillation only takes neutrinos from one type to another. So this blue uh, band actually matched exactly with the band predicted by the standard solar model or SSS. This is called a neutral current band because this interaction is neutral current interaction. Okay. So this band told you that the predictions of standard solar model are actually okay. and that essentially stalled the solar problem. Okay. Um, so if you look at earlier plots, where the ones that you already had seen, if you look now at the final plot, which is a neutral current uh, measurement you will see that expected yellow number of neutrinos and the predicted, uh, and sorry, and the observed blue neutrinos, the numbers match exactly. And this, in some sense, uh, vindicates our understanding of this. And this happened as recently as uh, of the, around when the experiment was given the results in 2002. So it is in 2002 that the puzzle of solar neutrinos was. Hello. Uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, so the fluxes you show right in the previous slide where you had the specific number of uh, one by six 
and one. Huh? So is this related to the branching ratio uh, somehow? Or, oh, this uh, is the no, branching ratio of cross section. So if it's uh, cross sections of these reactions, uh, okay. when the, the incoming particle is electron neutral, you know, the cross section is six times the cross section of U and T. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is because of the mass, the phase space separation. Uh, no, I'm just what trying to. No, this is not because of phase space, but because the UE also allows you to have a charged current interaction. See, this interaction that you see, the green one, can take okay. place both with charged current and neutral current. Okay. okay. Neutral okay. current will be true for all three species, but charged current only for UE. And therefore, okay. the cross section is very basic. Okay. And since the lower one is just the neutral current, that is why you have both the right. same. So here the cross section of uh, all three species is the same. Okay, thank you. Okay, hi Amol. Yeah. Uh, so, what? How different would be the masses of these three uh, flavors of neutrinos? Uh, am I jumping the gun already, or uh, we know? Okay. So, firstly, as as we we'll, as I'll come to it again, it makes no sense to ask about the masses of the neutrino flavors. However, to what extent we can um, yes. we can call them masses of neutrinos, they are all within uh, half uh, electron I see. Okay. 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 So all of them lie between uh, zero and 0.5 electron waves. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Next, we'll come to neutrinos from the cosmic rays because they are the ones that finally later on gave us the so-called atmospheric nuclear okay. So this diagram is similar to the figure that you see saw on my very, very first practice slide. Uh, this is a shower of cosmic ray particles producing pions and neons and electrons and so on. Uh, the showers start very, very high up. As you see, Mount Everest is here, uh, Concord flies here, the balloon experiment can go to this point, so about 30 kilometers or so. This uh, place at which the uh, cosmic ray showers. The interesting reactions for us are the decays of charged pions, which give you muons and muon neutrino, and uh, these muons further decay into electrons and uh, these two kinds of muons. These are the ones that are essentially those that produce uh, neutrinos. Okay. And uh, you perhaps know of this that the first atmospheric neutrinos were detected in the polar gold fields in Karnataka, uh, in India. Uh, this was the paper published on 15th August of 1965. So this is the detector in the polar gold fields. Uh, immediately, um, uh, observation also was made by another group, um, which was, I, I should say, afterwards. It's, in fact, both of them were contemporary. They were done almost in this, the same of the so, coming back to this, if you look at these two reactions, you will notice that if you forget the difference between neutrino and antineutrino for the moment, notice that the flux of muon neutrinos, which is this and this, will be about twice the flux of electron neutrinos. So, this means that if you observe the number of muon electron neutrinos, the ratio of these two, u by nu e, should be of the, of around two. Turns out that when the ratio was observed, it, it was less than two in many, many cases. So the question again was, why would that happen? Um, the resolution of that came by another very astute observation, which was made by the super They observed the following. So let's say this is the Earth. What you see here at top, you just detect it. Okay. Now, Look at neutrinos coming at an angle, it's called zenith angle theta, coming from top like this, um, which is the detector. And look at those neutrinos coming along the same line, but in opposite direction. Now, neutrinos are produced in the atmosphere. Therefore, number of neutrinos produced will be proportional to, will depend on the time spent in the atmosphere. And you see that this time spent is the same as this time spent. And this tells you that number of neutrinos coming from top at a given angle theta should be the same as those coming from bottom at the same angle. So this means the number of down neutrinos, the number of the same as number of up neutrinos. On the other hand, 
if neutrinos had masses and they mixed, calculations tell you that the probability of pure neutrinos going to some other kind of neutrinos depends on this combination. This theta is a mixing angle, sine squared root theta. And in this, L is the distance travel the neutrinos to the Earth. E is the energy of the neutrino. And delta m square is m2 square minus m1 square, which is the difference in the mass space of relevant pieces. Okay, this you can show by simple quantum mechanics. And what it would mean is that when neutrinos travel to the Earth, as they travel more and more distance, the more and more chances of them getting converted to other planets. Okay, so if they travel more, they get converted to more. Okay, so more neutrinos will be lost. Um, as you go to longer and longer distance. And notice that if you're going to come to the Earth, clearly you're going to travel more and more distance. And that means that number of neutrinos coming to the Earth or from below is going to decrease. Okay? So when cost theta is less than zero, the number of neutrinos is going to decrease. Okay. Um, Oops, uh, just one second. Okay, so 1998, uh, this is Takaki Kajita, who again got Nobel Prize for this discovery in 2015, was the one who presented this slide, which is uh, a very famous slide. This slide actually showed that the downgoing neutrinos indeed are lost, and the form that I showed on the earlier slide actually works perfectly well. This one. And this told you that indeed more new neutrons are lost, the angle dependence is the probability, and therefore the oscillation hypothesis is true. The atmospheric neutrino problem can be actually explained by the oscillation hypothesis. Okay. So this problem got solved in 1998, and therefore, by the end of last century, we sort of knew that both of these. Okay. So just to give you current status of this, we know that. Atmospheric neutrino problems solution comes through vacuum oscillations. Um, new moons convert to new tau. However, Earth matter also will have some effect on them for which we need more accurate experiments. The probability of survival is approximately this, not exactly. And the reason it is not exact is because there are Earth matter effects and there is a third neutron. However, the values of delta n square that appears here and theta that appears here have been reasonably limited. And these values have been also confirmed by experiments which do not need atmospheric neutrinos, but you produce neutrinos in your uh, in accelerators and look at them in, a, in the detector. Okay? So this works perfectly well. And that means that this is the, these are fundamental parameters and don't depend on atmospheres. For solar neutrinos, again, the problem is very similar, uh, except the solutions have, have slight subtleties. One is that the main reason here is oscillations in matter, because sun really, really plays a large role in this. Uh, neutrinos have different masses. Dewey mixes with others. The matter inside the sun plays a major role in determining how many of these electron neutrinos survive. And uh, the probability of survival, if you see, is given by this expression, which does not really have oscillations in it. And the reason is because uh, uh, when you go to MSW resonance, like the sun, turns out that you lose information on the phases. And uh, neutrinos that come out of the sun actually have lost their points. However, you can still measure the value of uh, theta naught and the value of delta n squared for uh, different means. And you can confirm them by experiments done at various reactors. So this part is now perfectly well done. The third problem, and not a problem because this was expected, that if uh, there are three neutrinos, there should be a third mixing angle. And that mixing angle should be observed if you look at the neutrinos from a reactor, and have a detector which is reasonably close to this reactor. So this was discovered in 2012, again, not so long back, not even a decade ago, but we observed that about 10% of the electron neutrinos, uh, electron antineutrinos are lost from the detector, which would go away by about a kilometer or so. 
um, and you exactly fit this formula, which you might remember looks very, very similar to the formula of the Earth. We have also observed neutrinos coming from the Earth or geoneutrinos because of national radioactivity. And in the future, this would be very useful to understand radioactivity. Okay. Um, so, any questions about uh, nuclear discovery so far? Okay. I think not. Okay, so I just proceed. And now I'll tell you about the current status of what we understand. Okay. So, firstly, as I kept on emphasizing always, first thing we know is that uh, nu e nu we are new tau do not have fixed masses. However, there are three mass eigenstates that appear after all of these two mix. So, uh, nu e therefore can have three possible masses m1, m2, and m3, similarly nu mu and similarly nu tau. Now, what are the values of these m1, m2, and m3? Again, we do not know the exact values, but what we know is we know m2 square minus m1 square because of that's equal to m square sum. Uh, and you will see here, this is called delta m square solar, difference between m2 square and m1 square, uh, and also it appears in the second figure. Why do I have two figures? I have two figures because delta m to atmospheric, which is like m3 square minus m2 square, cannot be measured directly. All we know is its magnitude. And because its sign is not known, this number can be plus or minus 2.4 times carbon. And therefore, the neutrino mass structure can have two different patterns. This is a normal, called a normal pattern, a normal ordering, a normal hierarchy. And this is called as the inverted pattern, inverted ordering. We do not know which of this it was by nature, and that means to explain. Um, we don't know what is the absolute neutrino masses, which means we don't know where the zero of this diagram is. The, uh, these lowest masses could be zero. Or zero can be very, very far below that. Uh, cosmology tells us that upper bound is something like 0.5 electron volts, or depending on how much you believe, it could even be of the order of 0.1 electron. Uh, we don't know if these are the all three neutrinos that we have. People do look and search for sterile neutrinos, but I won't talk about that in today's uh, talk. Uh, there are experiments that are going to look for leptonic charge parity violation. Um, and there are experiments that see whether neutrinos can be Majorana particles or if they, they can be relative, they can be old particles. So, all of these questions are physics questions, and experiments are there addressing all of these questions, so small and large, coming up with all possible world. Um, these are experimental questions. On the other hand, for people who are theorists, there are very important theory questions. And, um, one major theory question is how do neutrinos get their mass at all? Okay. So for those of you who know, know something of, of the theory, uh, this slide may make sense. So the standard model of particle physics, the mass arises from a term which has interaction of a left handed particle, a right handed particle, and the Higgs. So for example, electrons get mass because there is a left handed electron, a right handed electron, and Higgs. So they come together and give mass to electron, which is both uh, electron is both left and right -handed. However, there is no right handed neutrino, at least we don't know of any. And therefore, Higgs mechanism may not be. Okay. So it has to be something beyond a standard model, either a right handed neutrino or some other mechanism that we would make for mass. Okay, so at this point of time, we have no clue how neutrinos get their mass. And when I say we have no clue, uh, we mean that we have about a uh, thousand different mechanisms and we have no clue which of them is the correct, okay? Or whether any one of them is the correct one. To solve all these problems, okay, we are going to need bigger detectors, ambitious ones. These two are two of the biggest ones which are planned for the next decade. You might have heard of them. This is hyper Kamekwande, going to be a bigger version of super Kamekwande. What I challenge you now? With 260 kilotons. Yeah. Uh, if you look at atmospheric neutrinos, and we'll also look for neutrinos coming from Tokai, uh, which is uh, TK. Uh, this is called as P2H experiment, Tokai to hyperkamekande. 
uh, is of course in Japan. In US, the plans are for the so-called dual experiment, the deep undergone nuclear experiment, which is uh, which has a liquid argon uh, time projection chambers, uh, about, about 70 kilotons. Uh, and here again, we produce nuclear nodes in Fermi lab and send them to a mine, which is about 600 kilometers. So these are quite a long nuclear experiment. You'll, you'll hear about this uh, uh, in many nuclear talks. Uh, just to mention in India, uh, we are hoping to have the India-based nuclear observatory coming up very soon. It will be below this mountain, the same mountain that you saw in my title slide. This is a very special detector, uh, the kind of which is nowhere in the world. It's going to be an electromagnet, uh, 50 kilotons of it, so really huge electromagnet, the largest one uh, ever built so far. Uh, it is going to be put inside a tunnel uh, inside uh, these mountains called as uh, Bodhi waste hills near Madurai. Because it has magnetic field, uh, it can look and figure out whether the muon that is charged muon, which is produced by a neutrino, is a positive muon or a negative muon. And as we know, that tells us whether the, what entered was a neutrino or an anti -neutrino. So this is the only detector among the big ones that uh, are currently in the world that will be able to distinguish between neutrino and antineutrino. And as a result, it can distinguish, determine the mass hierarchy for a facility. So that is going to be its, its one major okay. So I'm going to stop here after my first part of my talk, which has told us how we have learned about neutrinos or um, how we have been observing neutrinos and learning about them. The next part of my talk is going to be what are these cases or opportunities when we look at neutral nodes and try to find out about the world. Okay. So let me uh, see if there are any questions at this point of time. Uh, otherwise, I'll go to uh, looking at the sky neutral nodes and what we can know. Guys, if you have any question, please ask. I think you proceed. Okay. Yeah. So now we'll go to neutrinos that are coming from the sky and what they tell us about different things. So two of the major advantages of observing neutrinos coming from the sky are kind of obvious. Okay. One is that they are chargeless and therefore they don't bend in the magnetic field in the galaxy. As a result, they point back to the source. Uh, this is something that is not possible with cosmic rays because cosmic ray protons bend in the magnetic fields of the galaxy. And therefore, we can never say where they are going to come from, even if we get very large signals. Of course, you can say light is perfectly fine because light does not bend in magnetic field, and indeed, light is what we use to take observations of the sky. However, note that light can come to us only from surfaces of stars. We cannot access light that is doing various things inside the stars from where light cannot be. There. Even the large part of our galaxy is actually obscured to us because of dust uh, in the galaxy, and therefore we are almost blind to a large part of the star. On the other hand, neutrinos undergo very minimal scattering. And therefore, they, they, therefore, they can come directly from regions from where light also can occur. And that's the reason that they are very ideal to look at this. The neutrinos that we see in the sky or can see in the sky can have a very wide range of energies. You see here, it can start from almost microelectron volts all the way to extra electron volts, which is 10 for 80 neutrons. At very low energies, we have cosmological neutrinos, uh, which are the so-called Big Bang neutrinos that we mentioned earlier. We'll come back to them again. At very extreme end, we have got GZK neutrinos, which are neutrinos of very, very high energy. In the middle, we have different energy ranges for different neutrino sources. Uh, the yellow ones that you see here are solar neutrinos, uh, which are of the order of uh, mega electron volts or AVVs or uh, hundreds of AVVs. Then you see neutrinos coming from a supernova burst. Uh, then you see reactor anti-neutrinos, background from old supernovae, 
atmospheric neutrinos and then neutrinos from AGNs or in general neutrinos from astrophysical sources. So almost 24 orders of magnitude. What we are going to do now is focus on uh, three of them. We focus in the extreme left region, which is cosmological neutrinos, central region, which is supernova neutrinos, and the neutrinos from astrophysical sources. Okay. So first we see neutrinos coming from a core collapse supernova and uh, try to see what are the things that uh, they can do. So this is what happens when a supernova is. Okay. So it's uh, it's a, the death of a star in some sense. Uh, but note that uh, the four fundamental forces of nature actually sort of you know, act in tandem uh, to make this thing. So what happens initially? So this is the core collapse supernova. Uh, it actually starts by being a star of mass about 10 times the mass of the sun. Okay. Uh, it usually has a so-called ion ring structure, which means hydrogen envelope on the outside, then helium, then oxygen, silicon, and so on, till the inner core, which is made up of iron. And as we all know, you cannot go beyond iron because iron has the largest binding energy for nuclear. Now, this is of course a very, uh, very dense and very hot atmosphere. However, uh, at the same time that nuclear reaction is happening, gravity is also playing its role and gravity is always trying to collapse the star. The stars stay in equilibrium because of well, two reasons. One is nuclear reactions, which are pushing the star outwards, producing energy and radiation. And secondly, the so-called electron degeneracy pressure that happens because the code is degenerate, and this is the quantum statistical mechanics phenomena, uh, which helps to keep the star in equilibrium. Okay. In fact, Sandra Shekhar was one of the first ones to, to quantum the star. As a result, once the nuclear reaction inside the core stop, then the gravity can actually dominate over the electron degeneracy pressure, radiation pressure now has become almost zero, and therefore there is implosion or collapse in which this core, uh, the core has a mass of maybe about 1.5 solar masses, okay, and it starts collapsing. Now once it collapses, it collapses from the uh, radius of uh, whatever it has. Uh, uh, I think about uh, 8,000 kilometers in this particular case to almost 10 kilometers. Okay, so radius decreases by 800 times, density increases by 10 power millimeters. As a result, you can almost reach uh, nuclear density. Now, when you reach nuclear densities, because of nuclear equation of state, there is a bounce back, and this bounce back actually pushes those in the falling matter out again. And that's what results in the shock. So ideally, this shock is going to blow up the whole star and the supernova. Things are not that simple because at the same time that uh, the core is exploding, all the outer envelopes, which have the mass of almost 10 solar masses, is still falling inside. And there's a tussle between the outgoing shock wave and the falling matter, uh, which would be lost by the shock wave, unless neutrinos push the shock wave from inside. So it turns out that at high, very high densities like 10 power 12 grams per cc or so, neutrinos are also trapped. And because they are trapped and cannot get out, they actually bounce against the shock wave from behind it. And that energy transfer actually ends up producing instabilities which can later on grow to explode the star. So producing the instability is the job of neutrino push and hydrodynamics takes care of this. Okay. Uh, the, what you see here is the picture of a crab nebula, which is a supernova, which was seen from the Earth in the year 2004. So uh, neutrinos keep on coming out of this supernova during this time uh, in various stages. In, in the first few tens of milliseconds, you get a burst only of electron neutrinos. 
which is called as a neutralization burst or a denaturalization burst. After that, uh, you get neutrinos of all species. You get UV, UV, U tau, UV bar, UV bar, UV tau bar. Uh, in the accretion phase, accretion phase is when the, the infalling matter is still falling inside. And then in the cooling phase, when the star has now reasonably stabilized. Note that all this thing, the star has stabilized, the neutrino process has stabilized. Note that all of this happen only in about 10 seconds. So neutrino emission that is at least relevant for us takes place only in the first 10 seconds of the star. However, as we will see, even these 10 seconds is going to give us uh, crucial information about what's happening in space. First thing that we know is that the average energy of electron neutrinos is lower than that of electron anti neutrinos and that of the newer tau neutrinos, which are often called as X angle because we don't really care whether it's new. Okay, so knowing this, uh, I'm now going to go to what happens inside the star as far as oscillation is concerned. And really, really fundamentally crazy things happen. Amol, I have a question in the previous slide. Sure. Uh, yeah. Like when uh, this estimation has been taken out, so this spherical symmetry, how it plays important role? Uh, like, is it uh, important during this calculation or something? Yes. So indeed, what people found is if they assume spherical symmetry, then the neutrino push that is given from inside will not be enough to explode the star. And that is the reason that in the last 10 or 15 years, people have come to the conclusion that neutrinos are not enough to explode the star. However, they're enough to call hydrodynamic instabilities. Okay? They are so-called SASI instabilities, standing accretion shock instabilities, which can later on grow up to uh, explode the star. So a spherically symmetric star does not explode because you need convection and you need formation of the instability. Okay. So indeed, indeed it's an important point that uh, no, nobody now takes a spherical explosion of a supernova single. It always happens by, uh, by instab instabilities produced uh, and uh, convection. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now these neutrinos, remember, are starting from a very, very highly dense core. Okay. And what that means is not only that the matter around it is very large, it's also that the density of neutrinos around them is very large. And that gives rise to an effect which is not seen or at least we do not know any other place in the world where they can be. And that effect is the fact that the neutrino, neutrino interaction, the neutrinos, they try to come out, interact with the atmosphere of neutrinos around them. And these interactions actually are very crucial in determining what are the neutrinos we are coming. This is the next step of what Wolfenstein, Michaelis, we now had done or matter if it's inside the sun. So inside the supernova, uh, very, very deep inside, the neutrino-neutrino interaction effects, which you would normally see, uh, no, should be very, very small because you know, these are just weak interaction. But a large number of neutrinos makes them uh, very important. These are called as collective effects, and they are non-linear because these are, no, the the way a neutrino interacts with another neutrino depends on the flavor. The flavor of the neutrino depends on oscillation. Oscillation of neutrinos depend on interaction. Okay, so this is a nonlinear effect, and you also get matter effects like the ones that Wolfenstein, Nikol, and Nikolaevsky. So what happens inside this? Therefore, is is pretty uh, nice and complicated. But today we will not go into that because I just want to talk about general things about it. Between supernova and Earth, nothing happens. Okay. And that's again because of the phenomenon that I mentioned earlier that the mass eigenstates uh, undergo decoherence on the way 
and therefore they travel almost independently when they come to the earth. On the other hand, when they reach the earth, okay, if the detector is not on this side of the earth, but on the other side, then they have to pass through the earth and then you can get what are called as earth matter effect inside the earth. Inside the earth. Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, so actually, I was just wondering uh, uh, about uh, the limits on this uh, neutrino neutrino interaction. Uh, so, uh, like recently, uh, from this Hubble tension, people have started quoting uh, uh, like neutrino neutrino self interaction, which is strong, like which is much stronger than what is the electroweak interaction. Uh, so, um, uh, roughly, uh, people quote that it is mediated by particles of the order of MeV instead of hundreds of GV. So, I was wondering, like, this might be a good place to put bounds on such interaction, right? I mean, so the, the ones that I am mentioning right now are completely standard model. There is no difference. Okay. Yeah. So, as we always do, first thing is you have to get rid of standard model. Better. Right, the new right. phenomena that I am, I, am, I am trying to allude to right now are completely standard. So these are not, these are just neutrino, neutrino, Z interaction. That's the normal uh, Yeah, so if some BSM exists like that, it would be very strongly constrained, is what I'm wondering. Uh, like MEV order. Yes. In it will be constrained if we observe it. So right now, we have not a single phenomenon, single neutrino, single supernova explosion from yes, which you okay. observe neutrinos at a large number. So. But that's true. In principle, yes. So, see, when the next supernova happens, we will be able to put a bound on many, many new BSN phenomena, one of which also will be there. Mm -hmm. okay. But remember that to conclude anything about BSN, we first know about, should know about SN. And right. even after work over the last 15 years, people haven't figured out the effects of the nonlinear collective effects in the SN. Oh, okay. okay. So I think we should first solve the SM effect and then go to the SM. Okay. Okay. So what are what are the interesting things that um, these neutral neutral interactions do? Uh, one question that always is uh, is troublesome for people who are exploring supernova is: Can neutral convergence affect Supernova explosions because right now uh, people do not put in uh, neutrino oscillations in their supernova explosion codes uh, simply because they are too time consuming. So, as I mentioned here, the simulations of light supernovae give explosions with the inclusion of uh, uh, convections and instabilities. However, you do you would like more push to the shock wave because uh, even heavier supernovae do affect it. Now, neutrinos will offer you one way to possibly help that, which is the following. See, non-electron neutrinos, which are new and new tau, have harder spectrum, right? they have higher energy. On the other hand, electron neutrinos have higher cross sections. Okay? We saw it earlier in two different contexts. So therefore, if you produce electron neutrinos and convert them to nu mu and nu tau, the nu mu and nu tau spectra, they will convert back to electron neutrinos and you will give a greater push to shock. Okay. So this helps you in both ways. So you use the hardness of primary spectra of nu mu and nu tau and use cross-sections of UV. And this, therefore, in principle, will give a larger push to the shock. However, this has to be sufficiently large. When the convergence happens deep inside the core, they will give it better push, okay? uh, clearly because the density is larger. So if you only had MSW resonances, the convergence happened around 1000 kilometers, which is too far outside, and it was seen that uh, there is no effect on explosions. If you take neutrino neutrino collective effects, they start happening in around 100 kilometers radius, so they will, of course, be slightly more. Food. What people have found in the last five years or so is that actually there can be the so called fast convergence 
we start happening at 10 kilometers from it. Okay. And uh, what these chromosomes need is that there should be some kind of angular anisotropy, but it's quite naturally possible because as we, we saw earlier, there is no need for us to have spherical symmetry. Okay. On top of that, anisotropies can also be anisotropies produced in the momenta, and there are ways to make it happen very easily. So it's possible that if you understand all the effects of collective oscillations, we may be able to solve the problem of uh, supermassive. This is what we had observed. Okay? On uh, February 23rd, 1987, we had observed uh, uh, about 25 nuclear events. Each of the event that you see here is just one neutrino. And they all came to us in about 10 seconds. They were observed at three different experiments. The light from the supernova is being observed for the last 10 years. Okay, the scale here is years. And I have these two next to each other to, uh, to let you see the contrast. This is a magnitude, uh, which means logarithmic scale. And uh, the red and blue are just uh, two red band and blue band observed in the red and blue. Element. Hubble telescope still observes the supernova and is here. Okay, so this is a 10 second signal from neutrinos, and this is a 10 year signal from, from light. Okay. This is what is the Hubble image of like, the supernova now. What it has done, it has confirmed the supernova cooling mechanism for neutrinos. Uh, the number of events was too small, so you cannot say much about neutrino mixing just by observing these events. But we did observe some constraints on supernova parameters. Okay. And uh, we got constraints on some new physics models, like neutrino decay, uh, decay into myrons, uh, axions inside the supernova, extra dimension, and so on. So clearly, the theorists are always going to be resourceful enough that any phenomenon that happens in the, in the supernova will be able to take your favorite model and try to actually get them out. However, no, you would all agree that 25 events is not enough. So you should actually want to hope for a future supernova. And supernova is not enough. We should have many detectors. So we have a, these are detectors that you see here, and the detectors that will be able to observe which was coming from a supernova. So of course, how many neutrinos are observed? depends on how far the supernova is. So normal convention is to take what is called a fiducial supernova, which is at a distance of about 10 kiloparsecs, okay, which is the center of our galaxy is about 8 kiloparsecs from the sun. So this is about near the center of our galaxy. So uh, as you see super Kamiokande here, we'll see about 10 to the power 4 events, and that is the largest. There are many small detectors. If you see about 100 or a few hundreds or tens of events. Ice cube, which is at the South Pole, we'll see about 10 to the power 6 events. There's a slight difference between what ice cube sees and what other detectors see. The ice cube will not be able to see each neutrino separately. However, it will be able to determine how many neutrinos have. So we are now in a reasonable way to reasonable position to be able to make the most out of neutrinos that come from a supernova. What will a galaxy supernova tell us? First thing that will happen is that instantly we we'll identify the neutrino mass order. Okay. So it turns out that the neutralization burst that I told you earlier, which happens in the first uh, maybe 10 milliseconds, almost disappears if the hierarchy ordering is normal and 30% of it states it is universal. So it's as if within 10 seconds or sorry, 10 milliseconds, you know the answer to the nuclear mass. You can also observe shockwave effects, and depending on whether you observe shockwave effects in neutrinos, we'll tell you that ordering is normal. If you observe them in anti neutrinos, the ordering is going to be normal. But again, this is about learning about neutrinos. Whereas I promised you that we learn something about the world you know, or the astrophysics. So, what can we learn about supernova from the neutrinos? The first and most important 
is that we can locate the supernova in the sky many many hours before the light arrives. So indeed, what happens is that the light from a supernova starts coming only after the star explodes. However, the shock wave actually takes about between six hours to one day for exploding the star. While the shock wave is traveling inside, light cannot escape. However, neutrinos can. Okay. So the neutrinos that we see here actually come almost uh, six hours to a day in advance. And you can actually say in which part of the sky you observe the supernova. And you know, in that case, the optical telescopes, for example, can point in that direction to be able to see the supernova really, really from the first moment. Second thing it can do is it can actually track the shock wave while it is still inside the mantle. Okay? Because the neutrinos pass the shock wave, the survival probability actually changes. And this change can be observed. Uh, in the time dependence of the neutrino flux coming in. There are signatures, I will not go into them, of UCD phase transition or the so called SASI instabilities that happen inside the star. All of these things happen before the star explodes and therefore cannot be seen in time. Okay. Uh, we can have hints on the nucleosynthesis of heavy elements called an R process, although this is no. Uh, perhaps not uh, so major as the as the first thing. Okay, so that's what we're going to learn from our supernova. And maybe again, let me take a, a small break to uh, see if people have any questions. Uh, guys, if you have any question, please ask him. Up to this point, anybody? No. So now we'll go to the other extreme, uh, not other extreme, the one extreme, which is neutrinos with ultra high energy. Okay, so remember, supernova neutrinos had energy of the order of 10 AU years. Okay. Now we are really, really, really going to go to very high energies, okay, which is right here, okay, more than hundreds of GBs. Uh, so this region. And uh, the sources that we will be able to see from here are, for example, uh, active galactic nuclei or okay, uh, gamma ray bursts. Okay. Whichever source produces charged pions will be able to give us neutrinos because charged pions always be okay. um, You may be able to measure individual sources or you may be able to measure diffuse flux which is accumulated over lifetime of the units. Okay, so it depends on what you're interested in. Once you observe them in sufficiently large numbers, we can understand mechanism of astrophysical phenomena, and we can also put limits on various uh, new physics parameters like Lorentz violation, nuclear dispute, etc. Okay, some of the examples you will see very, very soon. But for this, we need special detectors. And uh, most of you perhaps have heard of Ice Cube. I'll describe that very shortly, very short, so that uh, all of us are together. Uh, this is at the South Pole. It's called Ice Cube because uh, it's approximately cubical shape, about one kilometer uh, deep, one kilometer length, one kilometer breadth, although the shape is uh, not cubical, but hexagonal. Uh, it's about 1,500 meters below the surface of uh, South Pole. That simply so that the ice here is kind of nice and clean. Uh, it's huge, okay? So it, it has uh, one gigatons of ice, so much, much larger than what supercomputer is. Uh, this is the comparison with ice cream tower, which is very small as compared to the ice cream tower. So of course, nobody's going to go all the way down here to put the detector in. But what is done is all your detectors are tied to the so-called strings. And the strings are now sent down a hole. The hole is created by pushing in boiling water. So that it melts the ice and you get this nice vertical uh, hole. Uh, this is a string to which all these total multiplier loop or optical modules are tied at certain given distances. After some time, 
very slowly the ice will refreeze again and this will be fixed in seconds. And then what will happen is a neutrino comes, interacts with ice somewhere, produces a muon. The muon will travel like this. When it travels, it will give out Cherenkov light, and the Cherenkov light will be detected by the photomultiply tubes, and we will see the particles. This is the principle on which ice cube will work. Okay. Uh, ice cube threshold, which is quite large, of about 100 GeV, and the reason for that is because uh, you cannot afford to put this photomultiply tube very, very close together. The distance between two of these things is tens of meters. Okay. Uh, so, uh, if the neutrino is very, very high energy, which is very small, then it can lose the energy within those 10 meters. Of course, you won't lose it. Okay. So, the threshold is quite large, about 100 gigawatt volts. Controlled by the distance between optical units. So, what energy does ice cube see? For upgoing neutrinos, it can see from 100 GeV, that's 10 power electron volts, all the way till 10 power 60 electron volts. Now, why is why did I separate upgoing neutrinos? The result is because cosmic rays, which are upgoing, will not be available because cosmic rays will be absorbed by the Earth. For downgoing neutrinos, there are lots of cosmic rays showers coming, and it's very hard to distinguish neutrinos from cosmic. But for upgoing neutrinos, cosmic rays are not a background, and therefore you can see all the upgoing neutrinos all the way from 100 GeV till about 10 GeV. Okay. On the other hand, if you go beyond 10 power 16 electron volts, upgoing neutrinos won't be able to be seen because 10 GeV neutrinos. Get absorbed in Earth. At 10 TeV, the cross section of neutrinos is in the Earth is large enough that they actually get absorbed. In Earth. However, in that energy rate, now the cosmic ray flux has become so small that in that rate you can see downward neutrinos. So it's quite nice that in the lower energy rate you can see upward neutrinos, the higher energy rate you can see downward neutrinos because at nothing in the background it is. Now, it's not enough to see neutrinos, but you have to look at flavor of neutrinos. So you can, for muon neutrino, as I showed you, we can actually give a track. For electron neutrinos, you get events that are called as cascades because they are confined to a very small region. Electron neutrinos scatter very quickly and therefore don't leave a nice track. Uh, hadrons also give you a cascade and so do tau neutrinos. Sometimes, Tau neutrinos can give events, which are so called double bank events, but again, perhaps not in this talk. Uh, very recently, ice cube has started discovering neutrinos with very high energies of the order of uh, 10 power 15 electron volts or TEVs. Okay. And when they started looking, uh, finding them for the first time, they actually gave them nice names like Bert, Ernie, and Big Bird. What you see here, are actually events in ice cube. Each of the dots is uh, one photomultiply cube. The size of the dot tells you how big the energy deposited in the multi multi photomultiply cube is, and the color tells you the type of this. Okay, so actually, these events have a lot of information. And uh, people are still not sure whether they came from astrophysical sources or atmospheric sources, uh, but quite possibly the origin is. Uh, uh, so, as ice cube is looking at neutrinos, uh, which are uh, energy is more than 30 TeV. Uh, well, 50 for an old number, number now has grown quite a bit, so an old flight. Uh, I'm trying to figure out uh, figure out what uh, the power not get from it. But even with this, the fact that we can observe TeV neutrinos tells us that there are constraints on orange violation. But the velocity of uh, the neutrinos cannot be more than the velocity of light to anything more than 10 to minus 1. And again, this is uh, just something. Interact with electrons and actually produce a W boson on shell, which is a real W boson, not just intelligent. 
Okay. And this W goes on DKS to hydrons. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, so that's that's the process. The what you see in the ice group is a very, very special kind of event in which you get a cascade. In addition to a cascade, there is a muon which gives the Cherenkov code. So big cascade and a small Cherenkov code, which happened in you know, these two photomultiply tubes called Dome 54 and Dome 55, about which you will read a lot if you read this paper. Uh, this is a very, very special event. And this tells you that indeed this event actually came from uh, a Gasha resonance that W actually was uh, Again, just uh, some for people interested in particle physics, uh, this is the cross section for interactions of uh, neutrinos with nuclei or electrons, lines that look like this. On the other hand, if there's a Gasha resonance, you get a peak which is exactly at energies of uh, the center of mass energy of which produces. Uh, W. W goes on. Okay. Uh, and this is the event, event at this energy that is claimed to have been seen. So uh, what you see here is, is their simulations in which they show that this blue curve is the sort of uh, probability that this actually came from an event that looks like this. And the background events are, are this one. Okay. So they are, cannot be really sure. It came very sure if it came from these blue events, which is uh, Gasha resonance, or they came from charge current uh, electron events. However, it's quite horrible that they actually came from Gasha resonance. <coughs> okay. So now we are in the domain of neutral body energies of the order of. 10 power 15, 16, 17, 18. When you really go to 17, even nicer things happen, which is, so remember as energy of neutrinos increases, the cross section also goes up. So much so that 10 power 17 meter of neutrino can produce air showers with a reasonable probability even inside the atmosphere. And therefore, at such large energy, you could see air showers produced by neutrinos. Now, these will be seen at normal cosmic ray detection, which are not built with a neutrino. However, they will see neutrino air showers. The property of these air showers will be that they will not start at as high as 30 kilometers, but can start at the second kilometers. So note that air shower started by a proton cannot start at 10 kilometers because photons cannot penetrate as deep as 10 kilometers. They have to interact with the atmosphere. So if you observe a deep down going neutron shower, then that has to be from a, uh, a neutron. Of course, we haven't observed them anything yet so far, but uh, people are ready to observe. You can also try to identify them by looking at uh, uh, neutrinos that come to a hill, for example, or that skim the earth and so on. In both of these cases, this sort of assures you that what you are seeing is coming from a neutrino and not coming from a charge particle. Because charge particles cannot be this. Charge particles cannot pass through a heat, for example. But charge particles cannot you know, pass through the earth for so much distance for neutrinos. We are also trying, for example, to have balloons go very high up and look at what is called as radio Ascarian effect. And that's an effect similar to the Cherenkov effect, but now happening inside the atmosphere. Again, this can detect neutrinos of energy more than 10 plus 7 electron volts. Uh, we do not have a confirmed signal of, of this. Okay, so there have been some observations, but uh, really no confirmed okay. That has allowed us now to put very strong bounds to the limits on, on these hyperhydrogen neutrinos. What it allows us to do is it allows us to probe new physics in very different ways than we have done so far. So, for example, let's say we are able to determine the flavor ratios of neutrinos, uh, nu, 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 and nu tau. Now, we know that there are three kinds of astrophysical sources from which uh, we get neutrinos. One are so called neutron sources which produce 
new yields, but no new yield and no new down. Pion sources, it produced new yield and new yield in the ratio of one as to two. And the so called neon absorbing sources, where you only produce new yields and no other. This is the flux at the source. Of course, this flux is going to have between oscillations. If you put them in, then these ratios from three sources become, uh, as I showed on this slide, don't look at the numbers. As long as you notice that the numbers change from the top block to bottom block, that's not a problem. Now, some very typical special new to the index can change these ratios by a very large point. So, for example, if neutrinos decay, then we can actually get lower ratios, which are as extreme as 6 s to 1 s to 1 or 0 s to 1 s to 1, okay, depending on which neutrinos decay as well. So, therefore, measurements of these ratios will take us improve limits on the lifetime scale. Okay, so getting uh, so waiting for a long time and keeping on looking at the sky has this advantage. So you keep on observing things. Once you are able to get uh, enough amount of data, then you will be able to actually say something about all these things. Okay. Uh, so any uh, any comments, questions about the neutrinos from very high energy? Okay. In that case, I will now go to the other extreme. Okay. So we right now looked at about you know, 10 power 15, 16, 17 electron energies. Now we will go all the way down to milli electron energies. Okay. And these are the cosmological neutrinos with ultra small energy. Okay. Extremely small. Okay. So in this part now from here, we are going all the way here to look at these neutrinos. Of course, you will see that as far as number is concerned, numbers here are very, very low. However, energy is very low, and that is what will create the problem as you will see. Okay. Uh, just to get some idea of what we are looking for, we know that the relic density of neutrinos is for 110 neutrinos per flavor per centimeter cube. The temperature of the neutrinos okay, can be calculated uh, simply as a uh, factor of uh, cube root of 4 by 11. This comes from uh, calculations. Four by 10, of course, people need four by 10, or know how this factor comes. It turns out that the temperature of these neutrinos is about 1.9 Kelvin, which means the average energy is like 0.17 millilitre. So, uh... Uh, Amol, I, I just want to ask one thing, like CMB, we know that it follows a very good black body distribution. So here also similarly, same thing happen? Yes. So you will expect the neutrinos to also follow a very good black body distribution. Okay. Yeah. So because the neutrinos in the early are thermal. Okay. okay. So weak interactions, whether you call them weak, because in the early universe, uh, the densities are very, very high. The neutrinos actually will be thermalized. So we expect them to have thermalized completely to be a very good black okay. uh, We observe uh, when Planck, of course, gives us some limits about how many neutrinos and so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, this is the answer. What is the Sorry? source of having? This fraction, like 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.074, because we saw <coughs> that number of neutrinos in a standard model is three. So why this is 3.074? See what? So these are measurements that come from cosmology. From cosmology, the weak interaction of neutrinos don't matter much. What they measure is the number of light per year. Okay. Right. So therefore, when you say when you say effective number of neutrinos in cosmological language, we are actually referring to the equivalent number of light per year. 
a lot number of people. Okay, okay. And that's the reason that those can be different. Okay, so the next and this is the direct answer to a question that you raised at the beginning of the talk uh, about what will be the omega contribution of neutrinos and it's simply this this is an approximate number so omega neutrino by omega baryon is 0.5 times what mass of neutrinos so it depends on the summation of mass of neutrinos however one important thing is that the neutrinos allow us to look really really far back Let's compare with CMB photon. So CMB photons decoupled at around uh, four lakh years when the lifetime of universe was four and ten thousand years. The temperature was about 0.26 electron volts, and the value of uh, redshift was about 11. Relic neutrinos actually decoupled at time of 0.18 seconds. So the temperature was about two mega electron volts. And uh, the value of redshift of ten power ten. So you will see, indeed, that uh, we can probe, or if we are able to look at uh, the, the spectrum of these neutrinos, we have access to uh, time as close to Big Bang as about point two six, okay? uh, on set as uh, as large as ten. Now, seeing this is of course problematic because of the energy. So the way we detect either we detect neutrinos is we want them to produce some charged particles which will do something, no? Which will give Cherenkov light or at least at least they should be able to make some impact on the, on the detector, okay? And making some impact with 0.17 milli electron volt particle is is very very tough. But of course, you know, people have uh, great imagination and they try various techniques. So one technique. Is the idea of a torsion balance? Hello. Yeah. So I, I have come in the previous slide. Yeah. So in the n effective, uh, when you get it from experiment, uh, is there any theoretical assumption in this number that uh, you know is in uh, n effective from Planck? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, is there any theoretical? Yeah. So theoretical assumption is standard model. Okay, so we know does not have decay. Okay. okay, and it's a uh, uh, Dirac. Um, I am not sure if Dirac versus Majorana plays a role in the Planck universe. I am not sure of. My suspicion would be no, but I would bet my life on it. But I do not think Dirac versus Majorana makes a difference. Okay, okay so can... standard model means assuming that they are uh, massless. Assuming they are massless, see masses of neutrinos okay. do not matter for cosmic. Mm -hmm. I am not sure. I, I should I should not say. Uh, uh, I made a wrong statement. So of course, they matter for cosmic because so that's what that's what you get back. Um, uh, so so this is so that also was wrong. Okay? So it is you don't assume they to be massless. Okay? However, you uh, the small differences in masses that uh, cause the oscillation. Uh, that gives oscillation actually don't matter to it. Cosmology only measures the summation of neutrinos. Mm -hmm. okay. So they, uh, these two, uh, these parameters are ineffective. Actually, simply comes from effective parameter when you uh, solve the equations uh, for uh, for number of species present. And so it is uh, just number of uh, relativistic. Uh, relativistic for the whole species present at certain points of time is multiplied by certain uh, waiting time. So this is not the talk to go into exactly what that is. Uh, one can have Okay. Thanks. Okay. So let me tell you about this torsion balance idea. Although it's a warning that this is a something very practical one, but it's uh, well, it's, uh, it's a nice idea. So good, good, good. Now, so what's happening? So our uh, our Earth is passing through dark matter, which is present in our galaxy. Uh, this dark matter um, is basically stationary; it's not moving. On the other hand, Earth is moving through this uh, because the whole solar system is moving through this. Okay. Now, 
the relic neutrinos that form this whole dark matter around us ends up having a, a de Broglie wavelength of the order of 1.5 millimeter. Okay. So you know this because you know the temperature. So you know what is the average energy of this. Okay, so if you know average energy, like the same as average momentum, H by T calculate also be 1.5 millimeter. Which means that the neutrinos in the dark matter around us can interact coherently with spheres of size 1.5 mm. So what do you do? You make uh, uh, a plate like this A and with two halves A and B. Uh, B part is completely uniform. In the A part, you put lots of pellets of size 1.5 mm. As a result, what will happen is that the neutrinos, as, as this apparatus will, will pass along with the Earth to the neutrino background, uh, neutrinos will interact more with the A part. As a result, they will push the A part towards you, and the torsion balance will uh, have a slight torque. It will turn away. Okay. So people calculated what will happen if you have uh, small ion spheres like this here. And it turned out that with the current, uh, let's say with, if you with uh, uh, density of uh, neutrinos in the dark matter background, uh, as we measure currently, even if you multiply it by 100 times, okay, so let's say that the dark matter is more in the solar system, Simply because it has a large mass, so it will be a threat. Even then, the acceleration uh, that uh, it gives rise to is of the order of 10 power minus 26 centimeters per second squared. And you will notice that this indeed is an extremely, extremely small number. So, since the acceleration is very small, the torsion balance is not good enough. So, okay? turns of the torsion balance, uh, the way that we had have currently don't have this much sensitivity, it loses out by about a factor of 10 to the power of 10. So this is idea is good, but giving, given the numbers, it's not, not really bad. Uh, turns out that you put it to the Majorana, then you in fact have lose even by factors of 100 or 1000 or a million more. So uh, that is one of so it's quite interesting. On the other hand, the one idea that people have been working a lot on, okay, is the idea of inverse beta decay. So what you do is you look at a beta decay in which N1 goes to N2 electron and V bar. That will be a normal reaction. But now you say that perhaps if an electron neutrino from the background hits this nucleus, okay, it will induce the emission beta decay. So what will happen therefore is this electron that comes out will have energy which is about milli electron volt larger than what it would otherwise because energy is not lost in taking a UE bar, okay, but that energy can be given to electron. So this means that if you look at the endpoint spectrum of the energy of this electron, that endpoint spectrum will go just a few milli electron volts beyond the regular endpoint spectrum. So clearly you need a background free region and you need energy resolution of the order of milli electron volts. So these experiments are uh, still going on. Um, then the main aim of them right now is just to make it more background free and uh, to try to increase energy resolution. We are still very, very far away from actually this called experiment is called Kolevi, by the way. It's happening in Princeton, the one that has made a lot of progress. It uses uh, uh, H3 uh, with, with uh, 100 grams of pure H3, pure T shape. Um, but uh, all of these things are, are good. I just mentioned this so that uh, you understand that right all the way from 10 to 17 electron volts. We also go down to 10 power minus 3 minus 4 electron volts to be able to look at this. Okay, so there ends my, uh, my second part, and then and here with the last part, which is quite small. 
So if there are any questions about this very, very small energy materials, I can take them now, or uh, I will go to uh, this uh, nice feature of multi messenger tsunami, which has come out in the recent Thank you, Dr. Okay, uh, I don't see any questions. So I will tell you something about the multi messenger tsunami and the role of, of nuclear. So, by multi messengers, I right now referring to you know, three different messages. Um, one that you see on top in this experience are different forms of light. Okay. You look at the sky at different wavelengths gamma rays, X rays, visible light, infrared, radio, and so on. Okay. And what you see here in these pictures are actually pictures of the sky. In these different things. Okay, so it's the electromagnetic spectrum. On the other hand, we saw that in addition to this, now we can have a spectrum of nucleus or different energy. Okay. Of course, data we have currently is quite limited, but in principle, in future, we will have data of nucleus that might be. The picture that you see here, for example, is the map of the sky at energies more than. Uh, 10 p. I think it's 10 p. So, which means that slowly but surely, we have started mapping out the sky in terms of its neutrino sources of the order of 10 uh, it more than 11 10 p. And this will soon get filled. Uh, the right hand side figure here is the figure of gravitational waves. So, it looks at gravitational wave sources. These are just the first two sources. But remember that now we have got many, many tens of such sources, and uh, that will help us mapping this. What, of course, would be great is that we get the same event which we can observe from all of these things electromagnetic and uh, neutrinos and gravitons. Okay, so, that's, of course, a grand aim to have. Turns out that we did it once, just about three years ago. Uh, and this big user date is 22nd September 2017. Ice Cube actually found discovered a neutrino of very high energies, very high energy. And uh, as is the standard practice, if Ice Cube discovers a neutrino of very high energy, it gives a signal out to many of the X ray and gamma ray detectors around the world. Yeah. So in this map, you see detectors around the world. Some of them are on Earth, which are mainly three detectors. Okay. Some of them are in the sky on satellites. Okay. Now, once it was known uh, as to which direction the neutrino the, the came from, uh, X-ray detectors and camera detectors started looking in that direction. Uh, in about a few more days, the SIF satellite uh, saw, I think this is a gamma ray. Then for me is gamma rays, uh, assassin, I think saw X rays, and kind of uncertain, I think assassin sees X rays. Then Agilia Observatory, Liverpool Observatory, uh, Magic Gamma Ray Detector, all of them started seeing. In fact, there are a lot that came after this. I just did not have a nice, uh, good resolution figure of this. Turns out that this was a blazer, uh, which goes off uh, at unknown times. And because uh, ice cube uh, observation already was there, the other detectors knew that something is going to come out from this. So this is at least right now the first example that a neutrino identified a source and other detectors could follow it up afterwards. Uh, Blazar is a phenomenon that happens for quite, quite a long time. And that's the reason that uh, the detector saw it after, after the movie. Okay, but the starting was by by the ice cube. Okay, so once many detectors of neutrinos are online, of course the numbers that are going to observe will. So, um, to sort of wind up, uh, neutrinos offer us uh, a new window in the universe. You can look at the universe at extremely small scales, 
in the sense that you can identify mechanisms for generating mass and mixing patterns. Finding out original neutrino mass is, of course, something that is, in some sense, mainly a particle physics problem, or something that's happening at very, very high energies. The mechanism must have taken place very early in the universe. And that's something at very, very small scale. Uh, you can also understand phenomena at extremely large scales. Uh, of course, one is cosmological phenomena, like cosmic background, microwave background neutrinos, or the neutrino masses. Or you can understand very specific astrophysical phenomena, uh, like supernova, or AGMs, or GRDs, and so on. Once you have information from uh, light as well as from neutrinos. And of course, there are security applications that I uh, did not mention today, but uh, of course, we can go into when we discuss this. One which is not so speculative is nuclear non proliferation, because that has already started. People are trying to construct detectors, maybe water channel calls, and there are plans of uh, having a network of such detectors all around the world so that uh, we'll be able to sort of keep uh, monitoring on all the nuclear reactors. Uh, there are there have been suggestions of doing both tomography uh, with neutrinos. Uh, again, uh, I won't say this is very speculative, but that's something that definitely can be done. And even with current detectors, people are trying to uh, have tomography that uses neutrinos. Uh, these two, I would say, kind of speculative, but good to think. They indeed can be used for oil exploration, uh, because as you know, oil has different densities and neutrinos passing through different densities have different other effects. Uh, and uh, they have been also used for, uh, yeah, the ideas are there whereby they can be used for even long distance communication. Uh, I guess what is speculative is not the fact that it can be done, but it has been done. There have been messages using neutrinos have been sent from, uh, CERN to Grand Sasso lab in the in experiment called Opera. Uh, however, of course, uh, it, is, uh, it has not gone much beyond that. But again, it's, it's nice to think of these things and uh, realize that what is being done in the know is not uh, exactly just uh, learning about new particle physics, but also about learning new astrophysics and also in principle, uh, for which one can think of the really, really speculative thing, but uh, in course, useful. Okay, uh, maybe I will stop here. And if people have questions or specific comments, we can start discussing. I, think, uh, I hope I will have enough time for that. Thank you, Amol, for your uh, very, very nice and elaborative uh, contribution. I am very uh, I'm very sure that once I will post it in uh, uh, YouTube, it will be very, very helpful for students and everyone. Now, if anybody have any specific question, please ask him. Uh, because I'm uh, sure that he's very tired after giving a very long talk. But though, if you have a very specific question, please ask him. And I have one question before that. Uh, okay, just before that, everybody who are online right now, please unmute yourself and give a clap for his contribution. And uh, I have one question. So please give a clap for the speaker. And then please Hi. ask a question. Yeah. Sir, you mentioned that ice cube threshold energy is around 100 GeV. So how ice cube is measuring this on-shell production of W in glass or resonance? So glass or, uh, the neutrinos that form glass or resonance are energy of the order of 6.5 PE. Yes, but- So remember it is the on-shell production in the center of mass of W. So the center of mass energy of the collision of the incoming neutrino and the stationary electron is about 80 G. And for that, you need the energy of incoming neutrino to be around 6.5 P, 10 power 15 electron. Yes, I understand. But uh, when ice cube is observing, it's in the final state, it's produced W1 shell. So, yes. 
So, so this one uh, field W gives out particles whose total energy is of the order of 16. 6, 10, 10, 4, 15. And, uh, but yeah. they are measuring the W in the final state. So they are distinguished from the other signal also. How they are doing? Uh, so I didn't understand the question. See, basically what's happening is you are getting the shower of particles whose total energy is 16. It doesn't matter whether it's coming from W or not. What you do is you measure, let me, let me go to that slide. So remember that W is not stationary. W is not produced at rest. W is already produced in motion. So all of these dots that you see are photomultiplied to which are little. So the, the size of the dots, circles, depends on energy in the photomultiplier. Okay. Okay. So it is not that the only energy that is available here is the mass of W. This W decays to hadrons. Okay, this W which is decaying, which is traveling fast, decays to hadrons. The total energy of these hadrons is about uh, 6.5 kilo. Okay. So it's not that W is just produced, it's also has energy. Some. W is producing, W has a mass of about 80 GeV. It produced with energy of 6 P. So it's traveling very really steep area, very high speed. Okay. It's a real W which, you know, which propagates. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other question, guys? Guys, you have any other question? Uh, if not, then I will ask one question. Like uh, you have mentioned about this multi messenger thing. So could you please uh, say something about like uh, some detectability thing uh, in the context of LIGO, the observation of like gravitational waves. So like can we test some of the aspects of neutrinos in LIGO and all in a little bit? So it's, uh, it's possible uh, if the budget, for example, is up to neutron star. Mm -hmm. So black hole, black hole merger, you don't expect neutrons to come out. Mm -hmm. But in neutron stars mergers, neutron star mergers, this I don't think it is uh, any way forbidden for neutrinos to come out and be The main problem with observing neutrinos is of course uh, their number. Okay. Because only a small fraction of them is going to be detected. So for neutrinos to be observed from gravitational wave merger, we must have merger happening in our galaxy. Uh, if you observe a neutron star merger in our galaxy, it may be possible that you see some neutrinos coming in. Okay. So, guys, if you have any question, so uh, I have one, one question. Yeah, yeah. Can you please go to the slide where you showed the glacial resonance? Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, is it possible to uh, measure this effective vertex from this measurement, nu bar E, U, D, or other, other possible quarks? Uh, um, can you, uh, I didn't understand the question correctly, can you repeat again? Yeah, I mean, uh, is it possible to measure this uh, eff effective vertex from this measurement? Dimension six uh, coupling nu bar e and uh, u bar d were. Okay, if you want to really calculate the vertex, of course, one event is not enough. We need lots of uh, events with uh, nu bar electron going to hundred. Mm -hmm. Now, in ice cube, that process is actually quite hard. Mm -hmm. And the reason uh, that process is, is hard. Because even if it produces nu bar electrons, electrons also produce a cascade. Mm -hmm. okay. 
And therefore, if you look at a cascade, it is very difficult to say whether this cascade came from an electron or it came from a UD bundle. So mm -hmm. I think it's definitely not a practical way of looking at it. Also, notice that I still observed this uh, Lashua resonance event after you know, maybe full scale running of the order of five years. Mm -hmm. So, background that they have here, for example, background in about four to five years. Okay. So, if you want to measure, determine some vertex, you do not want a detector uh, that detects one event every few years. So yeah, yeah. That effective one, I think you have to go to collateral experience. Okay, just to see. So, is there is any other question, guys? Please, Disha, you have any question? No, actually, I have one question, but uh, okay, let yeah. me ask. Yes. It's not higher. So it's a very uh, basic question. Uh, in the introduction, when you were talking about different neutrino detectors, so different neutrino detectors are built from various materials, like you have water or in some, uh, in Dune, you showed argon, somewhere you showed uh, gallium and uh, somewhere, I don't know. So you showed the uh, chlorine detector. So, uh, so what goes into thinking of building this like ideally i would think that um, if a neutrino is coming it has to interact with electrons so maybe uh, if electron is in manis orbit those atoms would be good to consider or something like that uh, because electrons can be knocked out easily but argon is noble so <laughs> i got confused and then i saw other elements are lying like in between the tables so so I did not find any correlation. So, so firstly, good point. So firstly, uh, there is no chemistry here. Okay. Uh, I mean, not atomic chemistry. Because neutrinos, uh, so neutrinos that you usually see in solar atmospheric or high energy, have energy which are MeV or larger, right? mega electron volts. Okay. There are atomic orbitals, the binding energy of electrons, is you no know, electron volts to maybe AV, maybe go to very very AV. Okay, so that's the question. So therefore, the reason different elements can react differently is not because of where they are in the figure. Okay, the reactions. So the reactions with of neutrinos with all electrons is identical, independent of any. Okay, what matters in many of the experiments? Is the interaction of the uh, of neutrino with the nucleus. Now, chlorine, for example, as you saw, chlorine or gallium were really useful because of their nuclear chemistry, which means how their nuclear energy levels are. Okay. So the reason that uh, chlorine, okay, so the reason that chlorine had a threshold of let's say 0.9 was because the energy levels of chlorine were space such that when you go 0.9, when you get energy of 0.9 electron volt, from chlorine you get iron. Similarly for gallium. So the people who set up these experiments actually had a very good knowledge of uh, energy levels of these nuclei. That is where they chose these nuclei. Okay. So that is nuclear level. Okay, electron level, uh, there is no chemistry involved uh, or no, no periodic table group structure involved because anyway, such a high energy uh, yeah, neutrino will not care between 13.6 electron volts and 2 kV. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I understood. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I don't. Uh, you, you, please continue. Continue. No, no, I don't have any other question. Oh. So thank you all the listeners for your questions. And uh, last but not the least, thank you Amol for giving such a nice talk. And uh, one more thing, like uh, once I will post it in YouTube, I will share the link with you. You can share with students and all. And I'm very uh, thankful to you for giving such a nice talk.
it will be very very helpful for students and uh, last but not the least stay safe and healthy i think you are inside your home this is your study i think yeah uh, yes so stay safe and healthy so what is the situation of corona in mumbai right now well it's it's rising it's rising the numbers are rising and we are trying to save yes is it lockdown right now uh, it's not lockdown yet but it is been uh, so the cases are going up so i think we are uh, for example the government has not declared that things should work at 50% you no know, everybody should be asked to come on so you guys are not allowed to go to the department right we can go now we can go to the department but uh, not everyone is supposed to go every day yes we are uh, we have been asked to stay and work from home uh, in any way whenever possible as serious we have the luxury to do that uh, <laughs> yeah no like a uh, few months ago my father died with covid like oh okay so i'm sorry to say that and because of that i have to immediately come from germany and uh, the situation was like completely horrible i don't know how i have handled and uh, when i came the situation at kolkata was like extremely bad but somehow i have managed uh, yeah like things are not going good uh, but yeah hope for the best where are you now no Physically? right now right now i'm uh, in a visiting position at nizer but okay. now i am applying for the job and uh, okay. yeah because i have to immediately come there was no option and my mother okay. is also not doing good she's uh, a little bit like complete not little bit she's completely dependent on me so uh, yeah so th that's the main problem hope you can understand what is the situation yeah the situation yeah i do okay also very important so okay thanks nice to see you after long time and uh, stay safe and healthy and i i will not uh, disturb you <laughs> right now because you are really very tired i can understand so bye and good night see you okay bye good night thank you for the talk bye bye thank you